Hello, I am Joshua Gordon with the Sports Conflict Institute. We are live with SCI TV. Today I'm joined with uh, Dr. Ken Pendleton and Dr. Gary David. Welcome, gentlemen. Hi, Josh. Hey, Josh. And you're a regular on the guest. Gary, you're new to the show. Uh, Gary, you're from Bentley University, an associate professor of sociology and uh, an athlete yourself. Give a little background a bit about uh, some of your interest areas and in, uh, joining here today. Right. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me. And as you mentioned, I'm at Bentley University, where I've been for 16 years as an assistant professor of sociology. One of the courses I teach is sociology of sports. Along with being a professor, I participate in a lot of different activities, such as cyclocross, marathon running, a little ultra marathon running, mountain biking, endurance mountain biking, and last year, cross country skiing. So I try to keep things pretty varied. And as well, I am the co-host of a podcast called Elevation Trail, uh, where we talk about all things endurance sports that occur on trails. So all of the aforementioned activities I do, we discuss um, with myself and Tim Long with guests or just by ourselves examining what's going on in the world of sports on the trails. Yes, yeah, so our topic today that we were hoping to take on is this, you know, not an, a new topic, the topic of doping in sports and certainly the endurance sports that you're talking about, this becomes a major concern or consideration. There was an article recently in the Boston Globe, and I asked Ken to, to summarize it a bit, that made it a fairly compelling, strong case for allowing athletes to dope freely and to remove all of the restrictions out there. And Ken, maybe you could start with a quick summary of that, and then we'll take on some of the pluses and minuses of that from, and go from there. So a, a Swedish uh, author named Torbjorn Tensio, excuse, uh, excuse my pronunciation if it's slightly off, um, wrote a paste, uh, an article with the odd title, Let Athletes Dope a Moral Case. And most of us think that the very idea of using performance-enhancing drugs is immoral. And so the, the title was, it was quite rightly very provocative. And, and, and Mr. Tenzio raised the issue of why, you know, based, asked the most basic question. And so if we say, well, it's harmful to athletes to do something that's going to be in their, their, their long, you know, bad for their health in the long run, well, why would we let athletes play when, they're, when they have, you know, serious injuries, right? You know, why would we, you know, the issue of concussions, for example, might spring to mind. And on the other hand, if we say, well, you shouldn't have this additive value from using performance-enhancing drugs, why, why wouldn't we be concerned about that in music or in real-life pursuits? Like, I would imagine if I could get my surgeon to have steadier hands, I, I would not only say to him, you know, you, it's okay to morally permissible for you to use something that's a performance-enhancing drug. I would practically demand it of him morally. And as far as I know, there haven't been many scandals in the art world about musicians who use beta blockers or things that might enhance their performance. And so he raised, a, you know, I think a, a really interesting subject about, you know, at the most basic level is what is the rationale behind why we do this and what does it say about sport, you know, what, 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 how, how sports relates to society at large. Yeah, well, why don't we start there? Because as an athlete myself, I'm, I'm so ingrained in me that any form of enhancement is cheating. And for years, I've felt a sense of condemnation for anyone who does anything that adds to their natural talent. And so I, I always felt like, well, sport is about natural talent and hard work, and anything beyond that, per, you know, is a perverse version of sport. Why don't we start there? Your, your thoughts? I mean, is that too extreme a view that I have or that I hold deeply? Should we broaden it? Gary, what, what do you think first? I think what you just mentioned is right, and this is a point that's really missed in the article. The author claims that we celebrate those who have natural talent and ability. That's only part of the equation. The part about sports that we really like to celebrate and the reason why we have people play sports is the hard work part. Um, I'd ask you, Josh, right, who's more impressive to you, a person who runs a 2.30 marathon on pure talent with no training, or a person who runs a 3.30 marathon with little talent but a lot of dedication and hard work? Which one would you think is the one who should be honored more as embodying what we'd like to think about in terms of sports? Yeah, I mean, I've always been drawn towards the blue-collar athlete, the, the folks who put the work in, you know, really, in fact, overcome maybe some natural deficit, but put the work in and, and do some really impressive things despite a lack of talent. Now, I think that's the basic point, right? That's the point that's really missed in the article. He does raise some interesting points, and as Ken was just talking about with the heart surgeon example or uh, the music, musician example, but one of the things we have to look at more generally is that there's a reason why rules exist in the first place, right? 
And when we talk about sports, we're not just talking about professional athletes. When we're talking about surgeons, we are just talking about heart surgeons. When we're talking about professional musicians, we are to a certain extent just talking about them. You have to think about the trickle-down effect that such a situation would have, right? And number one, the fact that if professional athletes are doping, are using these substances, which can be harmful to the body, um, which has been proven, then that's going to trickle down to college athletics, high school athletics, and invariably it's going to end up in youth athletics as well. And so I don't think we can just focus on the professional athlete and the impacts there, but have to think about it throughout all of sports because that's where the impacts are going to be felt. Okay. So let me, let me ask, so if someone is taking a, re a restorative performance-enhancing drug, right, someone who wouldn't be able to play unless they, sh they shot, injected themselves with a painkiller, right, is that a bad example for youth athletes as well? I mean, you're saying, would we want to draw a line and say that's okay at the NFL level, Division One college level, but not okay below that or at the high school level? I think it's absolutely bad for youth athletes, absolutely. And one could argue, and it has been argued, especially around retired athletes, that taking such measures at the professional level is very harmful. Of course, the difference there is that professionals are adults who can make those decisions. The youth are not adults who don't necessarily have the capacity to do so. Someone might be acting on their behalf, or in high school they might be acting um, in that capacity, being pressured by a coach. So it's somewhat apples and oranges, right? But I think that at all those levels, there have been arguments made that it's counterproductive to their overall well-being. Yeah, I, I guess my point was slightly different, though, which is that we assume that, a trick, that if someone's taking an additive steroid, an additive performance-enhancing drug, that they're serving as a bad example for the youth. But aren't they serving as a bad example if they take a restorative one if they're in the NFL as well? You know, when you, when you see RG3 play in a playoff game when he's clearly, his knee is really hurting, there's part of us that celebrates that, right? Because that's what athletics, the, you know, the non one of the great non-cognitive values of athletics is supposed to show us that you overcome incredible adversity and in play, including playing through pain. Like Actually, in that example, the head coach took a lot of flack for putting RG3 in that game and said he was ruining his career. So I don't know how celebrated he was. Actually, a lot of the commentary and things I read on that was that it was really not well advised to put him in that situation. It could, could actually end up killing his career, which, if you look at his performance since then, might be true. Right. No, and, and, I, and I agree. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in that case, I, you can make a good case that his career has never recovered from that. Um, but I'm, I'm, what I'm getting at here is, on the one hand, we, it, we, we seem to be far more tolerant of using performance-enhancing drugs or, or, and, and, and people, in, people ignoring rest, normal restorative time frames, right? For example, that an athlete should be completely recovered when they play. But we seem to, we seem to really think that's sort of part and parcel of the non-cognitive value of sports. And it, but yet we problematize something that's additive that, as far as we know, does, you know, in many instances, does no harm at all, right? One of the things I would raise then is, I was thinking about this, take the speed limit example, right? <clears throat> How many, is, does going 56 and a 55 cause much harm? Probably not. Does going 58 and a 55 cause much harm? Probably not. Does that mean then we should just get rid of speed limits to let people go whatever they want to go? Probably not, because we all recognize the fact that when a person does exceed a safe realm of speed, whatever the context, that puts others in danger as well. And I think that here, the perfect rule, the absence of a perfect rule, does not mean we don't need rules at all. Well, let's talk about, you know, a bit as I listen to it, are we shifting what we value in sport? As that shifted over time, a lot of what Ken was highlighting is about the traditional sport ethic and the idea that you play through pain and that you win at all costs and you do that. Has that shifted a bit? Um, and the, could that in some ways be part of the solution? I mean, if there was such pressure for folks to be on the field no matter what, that they might turn to other substances. Is that part of it? Or are, in fact, we in love with innovation and the idea that we can think our way through how to advance the body? Where are we at with, with our relationship with sport? I think that the innovation part, right now, for example, the UCI, which is the governing body for, for professional cycling, has pretty strict guidelines on what kinds of enhancements you can make to a bike, let alone doping, right? So this whole idea of what does a bike have to be in terms of its geometry, components, weight, in order for it to be a legal bike. And at the same time, the bike manufacturers keep wanting to push in terms of the innovation to create better and better bikes. That's what engineers do, whether they're engineers of components or whether they're engineers of the body. They want to keep pushing those boundaries. And at some point, 
I think we have to look at what are the risks of pushing those boundaries. Again, we can make cars that can probably drive a lot faster and put them on the road. Is that a, a situation we want to create for ourselves? We could make athletes who can run faster, hit harder, jump higher, but at the same time, what are the impacts of those things going to be, such as, for instance, are people going to be getting hurt to a more significant degree because they can run faster and hit harder? So there needs, I think, to be some kind of regulator put on our innovation, even though it works against innovation. When we're talking about these larger, greater, quote-unquote, goods or, or, or harms, those are some important considerations we need to make. But, but, but let's be clear here. We're, when we're talking about rules, we're not talking about you can't continue to lift weights to get stronger. You can't continue to eat a, a very you know a diet that's incredibly heavy in protein, right? We're talking about using what quote unquote performance enhancing drugs. I think the first thing is, are, is that really more harmful than someone that like I remember reading a piece about a bodybuilder who ate, ate dozens of pounds of chicken every week. I can't imagine that's very good for his long term system, right? For, you know, for his health long term, should that be, should that be illegal? Should we put limits on how much weight people can lift during a week, right? Because that obviously, if someone all of a sudden is spending two, three, four hours a day in the gym during the off season and a couple hours during the season, they're going to have a huge advantage over the person who doesn't do that. And so, I, I, I guess if I was going to one last comment in that regard, if I was going to do that, I would actually think about how you would do it in terms of how the sports are structured, like in the case of football. I actually think the biggest mistake we made from a health point of view was allowing substitutions. Because before 1965 in college, you had to play both ways. If you came out of the game, you were out for the quarter. So when Alabama won the national title, their average often, they didn't have a single player on their team bigger than 210 pounds, right? So you didn't have 200, 340 pound linemen who were doing, by almost definition, incredibly unhealthy, totally legal things to compete in the very specialized world. So if I if I was actually going to do that, I wouldn't. I, I to me, I'm having a tough time drawing a line between saying it's perfectly permissible within legal means for someone to lift weights and become 340 pounds, which is clearly a horrible for someone's long-term health and a bad example for youth. On the one hand, saying, but you can't take certain. I understand the need for some rules, but you can't take certain drugs to get to that point. I would rather say let's structure the game in such a way where you essentially remove the incentive. It wouldn't make sense to be 340 pounds if you had to play every play because it simply wouldn't be productive for you as a football player anymore. It also wouldn't make sense to throw your body at someone at breakneck speed if you didn't have a helmet and shoulder pads and those things on there as well. So one could also make the argument that one of the biggest negative impacts in professional football or any football was the uh, invention of more and more protective equipment because it creates a sense that the person who's doing the hitting is uh, you know, invulnerable, right? So right. You, could, you could take that argument absolutely. And I, I think that, again, looking at it, uh, more holistically as a system, it's not just the doping, it's not just the weightlifting, it's also the way in which that we have marketed, right, the ESPNization of the big hit, of the what, what constitutes great performance. I mean, again, going back to the article, the, the author was making the assumption that culturally we always put the person who wins at the top pedestal, and that's just not true uh, internationally, right? We can go to professional cycling again, and look at the relationship between Jean Cancatil and Raymond Polidor. Polidor, always finishing second, was in many ways elevated in the French consciousness as being the preferred hero because of his struggle. So I think that culturally we also have to look at what things do we actually put a greater value on. Is it the winning and winning at all costs, which is really part of American culture, or is it the struggle of uh, excellence, no matter what the person's innate ability is. Right. I, I, yeah, I, I really agree on this point. I think that the key to solving any ethical issue is to is to make the aesthetic issues like the pr pursuit of excellence mo more important. Because if you think about it, if the goal is to win, cheating is is, is doesn't fundamentally undermine your you know your achievement, right? You know, if if, if you're going to get full credit for winning, but if what you're trying to do is achieve a kind of excellence or something that's aesthetically virtuous then cheating is like a blemish. It would be like painting the Mona Lisa with a zit on it, right? Like in take, you know, soccer, I think, is a really great advantage, of, a, example of this, that a lot of, you know, and, and it's not just Americans, a lot of, in a lot of the world, it's about getting results, right? And, and, you, in, in, and you basically, therefore, if a guy's going to beat you, you commit a professional foul, concede the yellow card, and, and because the goal is to, you know, to, to win, even if it's just one nothing. 
a personal example, if I may. This last year, I ran the Boston Marathon, and I ran 3:06. Okay, um, but my splits were about even from the first half to the second half. Now, 3:06 at Boston is not my fastest marathon time by any stretch, but it's probably the best Boston I ever ran. And I, I look at that Boston and say, I kind of got it right this time. I executed a plan. I stayed within myself. I ran the front half and back half, which is hard to do on that course, about even. And to me, it's it's a greater success than it was if I would have ran in the past, like 2:57, where I completely blew up the second half, as Josh knows I've done, and I'm sure Josh has experienced himself. So I think to your point, Ken, that is the reconfiguration of the value of the thing, right? What what is it that we see as worthy of praise? I think the author makes a good point in this, in that it may be to make it intentionally. The praise of winning at all costs is the thing that undermines the very value system that sports is supposed to have. So is, yeah. is the tension, in fact, then around the commercialization of sport? Because one of the things we know is that if you're trying to broaden your audience around any given sport, we start to shift from the aesthetic and the pure you know, value and beauty of a given sport to all these other qualities that are more on the heroic side. So you know, high points, high scoring for any given game, lots of uh, physical acts that you don't necessarily need to know the nuance of the sport, but you look at it and you see the extreme athleticism that goes into it. Those things seem to correlate more strongly with the idea that you would need enhanced athletes to continue that upward scale. I mean, I don't think we're evolving so rapidly that you know a sprinter is going to continue to get faster indefinitely. That doesn't seem to make sense. It would be equipment and tracks and then eventually substances and other things that would seem to evolve us, not just humans performing better forever and indefinitely. So is that some of the tension that we see around doping happens to be a, you know, going from amateurism and, and those things to a more commercialized setting? I don't, I'm not so sure. Part of that could be true, but if you think about what's the most lauded athletic team in history, it's Brazil's team in the 1970 World Cup, right? And they played in, in you know, almost transcendently platonic kind of soccer. And they became also the and they and they turned Brazil into a brand, right? So it was incredibly marketable to win while playing this, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, this transcendently beautiful game. As a matter of fact, Brazil became known branded as the beautiful team, right? And so I don't really think that the, there could, there's a you know, and I think most like most people who watch get that they get the idea that this wasn't just a win; it was something far greater than that. But I would say a couple things in American sports, it seems utterly beside the point. Right, we we almost can't conceive. Uh, we may say the, the 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 Lakers or the Celtics in the '80s played transcendent basketball at times, but the Lakers may have played transcendent basketball in '84. But when the Celtics intimidated them in the '84 final, the Celtics get all the credit. The Lakers get none. But I think there's something deeper that goes back to the roots of of Anglo-American sports, which is the sports was thought when it was resuscitated in the 19th century in in in, in English schools in America, and it was because on the idea that it had no intrinsic value, that its only value was non-cognitive. It was supposed to teach both players and then later spectators the value of trying hard and, and playing fairly, right? And no, think about that. No one ever says that about music or theater or film, right? We judge them by a much richer standard. So we sort of eviscerated the aesthetic meaning almost by definition of sports from the beginning within the Anglo-American tradition. And so, to me, you have to really go at that issue head on and say, how do we resuscitate it aesthetically? How do we get coaches, players to think that the goal isn't to have to win? A lot of teams win. It's to produce these transcendent moments, the beautiful, the really beautifully executed play. The, be you know, the, the, the player who plays like Magic Johnson or Larry Bird or Bobby Orr, right? So, in, in the, and you have to say, you know, we may or may not win, but we win, the goal is to produce something, and I really use the word platonic deliberately, because for Plato, the idea is it's something that transcends time. It becomes almost a form, an ideal for what people should do. But you almost never hear coaches say, you know, that it was that moment when you see that, just in, like the way LeBron James played, in, to bring up a jo an example just for Josh, the way LeBron James in that, played in that game five against the Celtics, you know, it, when his whole career was on the line. That was a transcendent performance, right? And it was totally compatible with winning, but it wasn't because he committed deliberate fouls. It's because he just played a perfect half of basketball in that game. And 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 I think that we don't do that often enough. We seem to settle for a kind of mediocrity. Let's eke out the result when the goal for every soccer team should be to play their own variation of Brazil in 1970. In basketball, it should be to play like the Lakers did in, 80, in 85 and the Celtics did in 86. 
right? And, but we don't, we're not, we don't have any inspirational language around sports. One of the, if I can take an example from ultra marathon running, um, where it's far less about the the time, the result, and much more about the experience. Uh, a few years back, I did an online survey of ultramarathon culture. had about 880 respondents, and plus being an elevation trial. The podcast, we talk about ultramarathoning quite a bit. And one of the points that we've, we've knocked around a lot is almost the absence of competition and the presence of experience. So people are looking less to beat another person or beat a time because you really can't compare times across days and courses for distances and more looking for that rich experience, that transcendent moment of, of, of completing the race or being on the mountain ridge as the sun comes up after going all night long and sharing that experience with others. The downside of that for, for ultra marathon running is that it does almost render it non-sport and become more play because there is an absence of competition for many. They might not train seriously. They're out there just to have fun. They might not care about their result. They might not care if they finish or not. They're out there just to experience nature and be amongst other like-minded people. And so we've actually talked about does that absence of competition. By the way, for a lot of the big ultra marathons, there is zero prize money for these races. Western states, there's no prize money for the winner. Leadville, there's no prize money for the winner. So there is no commercialization of it in terms of the prize purse. But does that mean you take out the essence of what sport means because there's less competition and more experience and as a result you really have no longer have sport you just have exercise yeah the, the idea you know if, if you do keep it in the competitive realm we have such a concept around having a level playing field and I think that's a very interesting concept to me of what a level playing field is if we talked about basketball and I were looking for a level playing field I'd look for a bunch of guys who are five foot seven and shorter right and that would be my level playing field. And then I think I have a pretty good chance on that team. You put a bunch of guys six foot five and bigger, I'm, I'm just a schlub on the court, right? And so what does it mean in sport where we are so different to have a level playing field? If we're, if we're not going to shift to pure activity mode, right, and we want competition, how do we – I mean, it doesn't sound like any of the three of us are particularly f a fan of opening the, the floodgates and letting anything go. So what are some of the systemic challenges then in, in – having some sort of enforceable means for what that level playing field would entail. Well, if you get back to performance enhancing drugs, I think that the enforcement issue is crucial. Even if we assume that you shouldn't be taking them for, for additive or restorative reasons, you have to ask, can you actually enforce that or else you put athletes in a, more, in a moral double bind? Because if it's unenforceable, they're either cheats because they're, they're doing it or they're suckers because it's quite likely other people are doing it. And so I, I would say, in, in terms of the, you know, about the issue of performance anti drugs, you really have to answer both of those questions. One is it which what forms of taking these drugs are actually bad or bad examples, and then two, even if that's we identify that class of one, to what extent can we enforce that in a way that doesn't actually call, undermine or make the whole system look incredibly hypocritical? And I think those are the two questions we should really be focusing on. And on that point, the point Ken's making, uh, I've long talked about having a two-tiered system, right, where expecting amateurs to adhere to the 1,200 medication list or item list that the World Anti-Doping Association provides is asking a lot and asking amateurs to follow the therapeutic use exemption protocols for getting TUEs from USADA or, you know, whatever anti-doping agency that there is, is asking a lot. I understand why it needs to be strictly enforced for the professionals. Number one, whether we agree with it or not, it is the rule, and there are people who race clean. And those people who race clean are punished by virtue of those who race dirty, right? But at the, at the amateur level, I, one of the things I've said quite a bit is everyone's a doper. And what I mean by that is if I'm taking some cold medication and I line up for a race, I might be having a prohibited substance that where if I was tested in competition, I would give a positive test. If I have you know, a heart condition and I am taking something, I don't have a TUE because I don't know I need a TUE, then I'm a doper. I've had people I know who have gone for TUEs for having low testosterone where the doctors have prescribed it. They can't get the therapy to use exemption because of the ambiguity of its origins, of the condition's origins. So then they can't race. And so I think going back to Ken's point, 
WADA and USADA has set up rules and a system that they themselves cannot provide as an avenue for people to adhere to. If everybody in the United States who's a master's level athlete, amateur athlete, actually filed a therapy youth exemption to USADA, they couldn't process all of the requests. So because they couldn't handle those number of requests, I think there needs to be some discussion about what kind of system do we put in place to allow people to follow the rules if they want to follow the rules. And right now we don't have it. Yeah, I, I really agree with Gary here and think that we really need to think about this as a is we really need to distinguish between elite athletics and 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 the next level and really think about because they're they're very different sets of challenges and problems that they both have. And I think he's you know Gary's done a great job of illustrating that in the case of, of, of long distance running, ultra marathoning. That, that essentially it, it, it seems to be an entirely unworkable and unnecessary and discriminatory system for the you know for the for the you know for most athletes and so we, you know I feel like we really need to there needs to be a much more subtle open-minded discussion about these distinctions and about what we're what you know what should be banned what shouldn't be banned and who it should what you know at what levels. Yeah, very very, very nice. I think. In, in terms of that proposal, I think it makes a lot of sense. It, it's not going as extreme by any means of saying, well, I, everyone dope, but it is making a really clear distinction between those who are doing this professionally where competition is the fundamental premise for why they're doing it, and then those of us who are doing it for experience and for other things. Competition is still an element of it, but to a, to a different extent. Um, and then also the concerns physically become different as people get into their master's years there, you know, the idea of a 75-year-old race walker getting busted for two years for doping because of hormone replacement therapy isn't really uh, a real appealing news story for anyone to have to deal with. And you know, what's the upside for that person not being able to participate for two years? Um, as we wrap the conversation, any final thoughts from each of you gentlemen on this topic of doping and some of the cases around it? If I can just throw another example, Josh, you made me think about just another wrinkle in this. As a for instance. Alabama has some very strict laws for women in who are pregnant in terms of what kinds of uh, drugs they can ingest, right? And so just going to this point about the, the, the systemic element that we're really talking about, it's not just limited to sports, I started to wonder about if a woman was a professional athlete who was pregnant um, but still wants to compete professionally while pregnant in those early stages and then is ingesting drugs that are legal if we got rid of the doping rules, right? Then what about the uh, state rules or the federal rules, laws? You know, would would a woman, let's say steroids were legal to take or HGH was legal to take, and a pregnant, you know, we don't. By that I mean we don't criminalize it in sport, but the state criminalizes it, right? And she takes it, and now she can be put in jail in Alabama for taking a drug that harms a fetus. I just throw it out there as a extreme example. I know philosophers like extreme examples, so it's also for Ken's benefit. But to kind of think about the complexities of this, right, when we're thinking about it. So even though the, uh, the author of the article presented something that was very intriguing in terms of discussion point, it does raise the, the need for more nuanced discussions uh, right now. Just as a one more point, the, the new president of the USA Cycling Association has made the statement that any master's level competitor who has a positive test should be banned for life. And I think when you take that kind of approach, I think that really misses the point of the nuance and the complexity at the different levels that we're talking about. And Ken, how about for you? Any final thoughts to wrap here today? Yeah, I want to quickly amplify on this idea of the intrinsic value. And, and I think we need a more complex philosophical discussion on this because when you think of someone who, uh, like the guy who, you know, the, who did Man on Wire, you know, the guy who walked across the trade towers, or someone who more mundanely just climbs a mountain, should they be allowed to do it given the probability of, you know, of catastrophe? I, 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 the answer, in my view, is yes, right? Because there's something so intrinsically valuable, and also it's about your right as an adult to be able to take risk, right? And and so I, I think we ought to ask why with sports do we I, I, I'm really uncomfortable with the idea that we we're so we seem to be more worried the Catalonians have an expression Americans worry more about dying than living that's what they say to you if you start to condemn them for smoking <laughs> and I'm, I'm inclined to think that we need to think well how come we don't think it's worth taking risk in sports why is it not okay to risk your health in sports but it would be if you were if you're gonna climb a mountain peak or walk from one trade center to the to, you know, to the other 
right? And and so I think there's some there's a larger discussion that goes back to how we've sort of devalued sports to the point where we think, well, the only value is non-cognitive, and therefore if it's not doing that, then then it's it's failing. Whereas I think the it's, sports by definition should be inspirational, and I think that makes it a much more complex discussion about what are fair or foul means to do something inspirational. Yeah, I, I, to pick up on that thread and to wrap up, can I, I love the thread of inspirational. And for me, the things that I find most compelling about sport is that hard work story and what someone does to put effort in. And for myself, you could open up all of the doping in the world. I wouldn't do any of it because it wouldn't be appealing to me. Right? It wouldn't answer the question for myself, what can I accomplish through hard work? What is that meditative-like state of daily grinding through your training regimen, your workouts, and seeing what you can progress, how much you could stave off father time as we get older. Gary and I are not getting younger in our competitive lives, but we still have lots of goals and accomplishments ahead of us. And it's not going to be racing against our 25-year-old versions of ourselves, right? And I, I don't want artificial means to, to go there. And at the same time, um, if I knew others were doing it, I think I'd, I, I wouldn't find their story particularly compelling to me. And so I, at least I'd like to know that the folks I'm – I'm rooting for, have a story I can believe in, and it's not just mythology. And so I, I do want the system to be improved. I do want to be able to know that what's out there is actually genuine and people are competing, and then I, I can be inspired on a more regular basis. Uh, yeah, at the risk of sort of following, you know, taking a little bit too much time, I can't help but think of Matt Harvey and the decision about whether he's going to exceed his innings count in the playoffs and, and how troubling that is to me because I know it makes sense from a commercial point of view, because he's, you know, he, he, it's probably a law. It's a bad financial decision in the long run. But we don't watch sports for financial reasons. We watch it because we want to see someone go for glory, and do something transcendent and take risk. And then I think of Sandy Koufax in 1965. He could, he had to miss one of his turns in the World Series because he was celebrating Yom Kippur, and so he pitched a complete game in games five and seven, right? And in game seven, he did it when he couldn't even throw a curveball, right? He had he was relying entirely on one pitch. And was that a good move in terms of he retired after the next season? He obviously overworked his arm. But you know what? That's the transcendent value. He got something intangible that's far more valuable than the hundreds of thousands of dollars he might have made. He got a kind of immortality because he observed his Jewish holiday, and then he still went out and blew, to paraphrase something he said to his catcher that threw in some words I can't use, with a fastball alone, he blew the Minnesota Twins away. And that's why we watch sports. Sports isn't about perspective. It's about losing perspective. And I think we lose sight of that when we start, when we, you know, and, and as much as RG3, it's easy to be critical of the Washington, but you know what, it's a playoff game. I want to believe in that moment you don't care about 10 years down the road. You're thinking, I want to win this game because that's, that's why we watch it. If we think they all kept it in perspective, we'd go do something else. So there's a very different experience for the ordinary athlete and for the elite athlete in my mind. All right. Well, thank you both so much for the conversation. I really enjoyed it and hope to have you both back on again soon. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Josh.